research question development, which is the next phase or the next step. And uh, if you have your laptop, most you do, you can go into the uh, professional research project folder. It's down near the bottom. And uh, if you scroll down, now you can see in that folder, I have the general description video of the overall research project. And if some of you have lost sight of that, you can watch that first video. That second video is your annotated bibliography. That's your references and a description summary with that. And I believe that's due in two or three weeks. And we just went through that last week. And so that was a video that I created specific to that. Uh, the third link down then is developing your research questions. You can open that blue hyperlink. I'm going to highlight a couple of pieces. Uh, that's pertinent information you can take home. I'm certainly going to talk through it today. Uh, Josh is going to video this for the sake of those that are working remotely. But I want to talk specifically today about taking your topic from a general research topic and moving it to a more specific research um, question or series of questions where you would target your research to answer those questions. So most researchers, when we pick a topic for research, and we begin to look at the literature, what you'll find is there's this very large, broad swath or plethora of information about a given topic. If you were wanting to discuss uh, finance and professional sport or strength conditioning techniques or the latest management styles, there would be just such a large, broad swath. And what, what you would find is if you took all of that and began to review it, much of that literature would be uh, varied across eight or 10 or 12 different perspectives. And it would be too broad to focus any one given uh, research topic on. So what we need to do is to narrowly focus our topic down out of a macro perspective, coming down into more of a micro perspective. So you can look at specifically coaching styles or characteristics of an athletic director or strength conditioning for the hockey player. So where you're narrowing it down to a specific area, then you can begin to pull the literature that's most applicable and push aside everything that's least applicable. Now that should seem obvious, but until you do it and actually walk through it, it's a, it's a little bit of a process for you. So let me start today by going around the room again. And I ask you to come in today with your research topic settled. Uh, so I wanna hear from you your research topic, share it with the class, let me understand it, and then I'll go into developing our research questions. So we'll start over here with Millie, and we'll just go right down and back and forth. So Millie, start with you and tell us your topic. Pretty specific. So ADHD, athletics, and coaching, and performance. Yeah, I think that's very narrowed down, uh, and that's good. So, so ADHD and athletics. I think you're going to find a lot on that. The the way to coach that or not coach that, you might have to derive that out of when you're reading literature about ADHD and athletics and performance. You may have to derive that out of the assertions and the assumptions. Uh, not the assumptions, the assertions and the inferences of researchers. So when researchers do research, uh, usually at the very end, they'll make assertions and then they'll make inferences uh, about their findings. And so a lot of times, unless you find specific things about coaching athletes with ADHD, and there probably is some on that, don't be surprised if some of the other literature will have inferences and implications and applications that you might also be able to pull from and then use to build your basis. Um, as we go through our topics, we're going to have to make sure when you start researching, there's critical mass to your particular topic. Now, what that means is there's enough information specific to your topic to build a research report to which your presentation will come out of. We'll get to the presentation later. But if you don't have uh, high quality critical mass and materials to build a quality research report on, everything you'll be reporting on is assertions and assumptions. And we can't just build based on supposition. So for this particular project, you've got to go gather the materials that people have already researched. And you're gonna summarize it, and you're gonna put it together in a cogent method, and you're gonna compare and contrast, you're gonna go through it, and you're gonna report that back to us. Thank you. Alex. I'm gonna research the task force management and how to properly fund it for our public law school. Nice. So I think you're gonna find a lot on, first of all, the budgeting. 
of public recreational facilities and, and how the budgeting process goes. And I think you'll find enough on finances of golf courses and then you can make that comparison. There may not be a ton on the, the, the budgeting process or the financing of public versus private, but I think if you combine the two, you'll be able to have enough there to work with. Good. Matt? So, um, all standard or ordinary pricing styles? Okay, and I mentioned those in class, and you can certainly compare and contrast three. Uh, you can choose two if you want to compare and contrast, or you can choose just the one you feel like you you most resemble or represent, you can certainly just go on with that one. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with comparing, I think I mentioned the other day, uh, democratic, autocratic, and uh, laissez-faire. And so sometimes you'll find coaches actually flow um, between and amongst them. So you may have a, a defined bent toward one. So for example, the democratic coaching style, but then you may find times situationally you may move into more of a laissez-faire coaching style. So it's important to know how those styles work, what they look like, and then the application in certain settings. Garrett? Um, what coaching characteristics do you need to be strong in a person in those two specific settings? Nice. Yes, so coaching characteristics and the players and that interpersonal relationship. Yeah, that's going to be communication. Uh, that'll be some sociology, some sociological stuff. And uh, I think, I think honestly, if you look at the, even the communication literature, you may find some communication research that is directly applicable in that. Good. Grayson? I'm going to do the, take the psychological uh, effects of negative coaching behaviors. Yeah, so, so what, what is the impact, here's your research question, what is the impact of negative coaching on the psyche of a student athlete or the psyche of an athlete? Yeah, so what's the impact? So you wanna directly answer that question, you wanna know and then by answering that, you're going to be discussing and describing, here's what the research says, negative coaching and the relationship with the student athlete or the, the impact, performance impact, psychological impact, emotional impacts, those sort of things. And you may want to focus on one or more of those or just a broad spectrum of those. Good, Nick? Uh, I'm doing mine on how an athlete's mental state affects their performance. Okay, mental state meaning what? That needs to be defined and that's a good thing to note here is that when we look at variables, in, uh, indirect and direct variables, independent and dependent variables, uh, we will probably have to define them for the reader or for your presenting audience. So if you have a topic that, that we're not very familiar with, and say it again because there was a variable in there. How an athlete's mental state affects their performance. Yeah, so what, one of the things he'll have to define for us is what is the mental state, because otherwise many people would have a personal definition or at least some level of assertion of what that is. And so when you dive into your research, make sure that when you come across what are called key words or key phrases, that you define them for yourself and you're preparing to define and describe them for us. What you never wanna do in any kind of research setting, any kind of report you're writing, any kind of presentation, you never want to assume that your audience automatically knows what all those things mean. And so what happens is you start to study a given topic and then if you become more comprehensively um, competent in it, that as you start to speak it, it's easy to take for granted that your, your audience would know or not know those things. So when you come across those kinds of variables, you're going to need to define and discern them for us. Right, one more time so I can come back to it. How does an athlete's mental state affect their performance? Yeah, so what you're gonna look at is the social, psychological, that's probably a lot of sports psychology, the psychological state and uh, the performance. So that could be everything from how they feel about themselves, personal security, how they feel about their relationship with their coach, um, whether they're in a good state of mind or not so good, and there's a lot of variables there. And, and the direct impact and the indirect impact So sport ministry, impact injured athletes, is that right? Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a, I don't know if there's a lot of literature on that, so we'll have to dig around the peripheral and see uh, where we can make application. Uh, I do, 
I spent a lot of time looking at the journals in sport management. Now there's literally a hundred of them, but the, some of the key, what are called research one journals. And usually what happens is authors take a thread and they'll, they'll research that thread uh, for years and years and years. So I'm, I, the whole area of sport ministry is fairly new. And I've got some good research reports on sport ministry. Now whether or not they apply to injured athletes, I don't know. We can certainly make connections. So here's a great example. And I'm not gonna tell you that you don't have to do a topic, but if you find that there's not a lot of critical mass, and this is not for Lindsay, this is for all of us. If you find that there's just not a lot of stuff, there's two ways to go about expanding your research topic. First of all, if you find one really good study that absolutely nails your topic, Go to their reference list. I think I mentioned this before, but go straight to their reference list and look at all the references that they use for their research report. And you may find an additional five or six or seven research reports or studies there that they use that would be equally valuable to your research report. So if you land on a good a dissertation or a thesis or a good research article that really nails your topic, go back and look at all the sources they use to build their bases of research and don't be afraid to pull many of those and look at them just because they use them for a study does not nullify that you can use them you can actually pull that stuff and use it as well any independent study is available to you the second thing is you might have to look at other um, research bases so if she's looking at something that deals with injured athletes we might have to look in in the sports sciences for injured athletes and, and I don't want to say ministering to injured athletes, but addressing and dealing with injured athletes. And so maybe there's a connection that you can make between br bridging two research threads together. And so that would be considered new research. So most of the stuff that all of us in here are going to look at is already current trending uh, topics that have been researched, lots of stuff published. But on occasion, if we're trying to thread a topic together and it's fairly new, and what we may have to do is actually pull, and Lindsay, this might be a good idea, some two or three um, disciplines to thread those together. And so you might be making a lot of applications or implications where there's not been direct research. But again, I don't know until you get into the topic. Isaac? Uh, yeah, looking at HR for sport, for sport agents. So looking at contract law, advertising, endorsement, development, different things like that. So yeah. breaking down different categories of sport agents. Good, good. Now here's, a, here's one for all of us that we need to make sure that when it, and Isaac and all of us advance to the next phase, which is writing the research questions, is that we're very specific with details. So the, the entire sport agent realm is pretty big. And so what, what Isaac and, and all of us in here are gonna have to do is take our topic and narrow it down to a specific focus research question. So maybe he's just interested in contract law or maybe the, the interaction of the agent to the, uh, uh, to the hiring individual, the, the, the professional athlete, or sometimes professional coaches. Remember, coaches hire, uh, and lots of people uh, on the professional level hire agents. So maybe it's the agent interaction with the client, uh, or maybe it's the agent's interaction with uh, sponsoring or, or endorsing uh, constituent groups. So there could be a number of things that you want to look at, but you'll want to narrow that down unless you want to describe the characteristics of just a sport agent and say, hey, here's what an agent is and what they do. That's very broad. And you may want to focus that down to very narrow. Ivana? Um, building up mental self-motivation. Yeah, that's a good one. I know we talked about that before. So you're going to have to define for us there's a variable. So one of the questions all of us should ask her is, what is mental toughness? Yeah. What does mental toughness mean to you? And the best way to create a definition is actually get it out of the literature. So as you're studying what other people have already written, find out how they define mental toughness and then use their definitions as your basis to build off of that. And so you'd actually would cite your reference though. Well, according to, to, to Briggs and Brennan in, in 2017, mental toughness is, and then you would, because you found that in the literature and that's a defined variable that you're going to use. So um, again, what was it about mental toughness? Building up mental toughness about so how to build it up in an individual, how to develop it, how, how to train it, how to extract it. How, yes, that's good. I like that. That's going to be in the sports sciences, but also the sports psychology literature. So you may not find too much in, in the traditional sport management journals, because much of the journal of sport management, journal of sport marketing, journal of college athletics, they're going to be focused on the business 
in the application. So you may have to go into some of the sports science centers, uh, uh, sports medicine, exercise, sports science would be two examples. But I can help you look for some more of those if you want. Yeah. Jack? Um, do you want to do like a fi finance in any computations in professional team? Yeah, finance. Uh, and applications with a professional sports team, right? We talked about that earlier, yeah. So there's several ways to approach that. Obviously, there's the capital investment to start a new team, but I think you're more interested in the operations of the team. So looking at a, uh, a an operating team, and it could be a football team, a basketball team, could be a soccer team, could be one that's overseas, and beginning to look at what's the financial parameters of those operations. There's a lot of literature on finance of public and private sport operations. Um, you may find it, again, it's very broad and you want to narrow down yeah. to maybe just revenues or just expenditures. But if you just want to give a, a report, you can report on, well, here's, here's what the Atlanta Falcons financials look like. Well, then obviously you can go into the Falcons financials that are made public and you can look at the last 10 years and say, okay, here's, here's how that organization operates or the, uh, or the Shadow Bobcats, for example. Here, here's what the financial, what's publicly disclosed. Now, not everything's public, remember that, because many of these are private, or, well, most all of them are, are private organizations. But there should be enough literature out there and information in the public realm uh, for you to capture and then begin to draw some conclusions about it. Corey? Uh, so I'm gonna do the misuse of power in coaching. That's a good one. So uh, power, sociology, is where you're gonna land on that, sports sociology journal, some psychology, and that I assume you're referring to um, coaches or administrators, yeah, and team like, owners. So not, I mean, not specifically, but like the transaction stuff, and things like that, just the over time, like how power has been yep. misused or uh, taken advantage yep. of. So you may wanna start in the general literature of, because I think, I'm pretty sure power has been exegeted quite a bit in just the management literature. So you may want to go in just the general business and management literature and look at how they've defined power and, and what the research is on power and, and people in society. And obviously you can make application, but then you can pare down further to the sports setting. And I know there's been probably enough case studies on that. For example, the one you mentioned with Penn State, but there are plenty of case studies on that. I don't know how much literature is directly relevant to that in sport, but there should be enough case examples for you to draw from. John? Uh, I'm going to talk about the effect of the first face-to-face -face act on college sport. Yeah, that's fairly new. We talked about that, you and I did. Yeah. And uh, I know there's a lot of material that's been published about it. I don't know how much of the, uh, the effects, because it's really still kind of being rolled out. It's really, it's a, uh, how do I say, I'm going to get an opinion on the main yeah. Yeah. Well, use the literature to build your basis of what it is. So describe, and even describe it historically how we got here and what it is. And then you can, yes, uh, so in that case, you may want to, to do some other research leanings to get some feedback from professionals who work in the area in order to build your basis for that. Josh, what are you gonna study? <laughs> You're not. Wait till next year. Wait till next year. Wait till next year. Good answer. Okay, so let's move from topic to research question. And research questions, I've given you two really, really good handout on that. I've spent a lot of time through the years as a personal researcher, uh, kind of developing this for our students. But largely, research questions help you narrow down your topic into something that's measurable, something that's focused, something that's quantifiable or qualifiable. And it, it allows you to be able to focus in and discern this, this is good for my topic and this is not good. In some regards, it helps you pare down the literature that you're looking at into the do's and don'ts and what is qualified and what is unqualified for my material. But for those of you that are interested to differentiate the research kinds of questions, if you're interested in a broader topic, a broad-based topic, uh, oftentimes we'll land on a quantifiable research question or series of questions where you want to describe and compare or build a relationship. So a couple of us want to know the relationship between uh, power and the student athlete or negative coaching and the student athlete or, or whatever it is. So if you're looking to draw relationships, if you're looking like Matt is to compare coaching styles. So Matt, one of your basic quantitative research questions could be, well, what are the differences between the 
autocratic leadership and encroaching and, and laissez-faire leadership. And it's really that simple. So in that regard, your question, which starts with the word what, is going to merely ask what are the differences? And then you're going to be researching to answer that question. So for those of you that are comparing something, and that's a good example, or you're describing a state of affairs. So maybe maybe Jack is going to merely describe the, the financial situation of the Atlanta Falcons or the Charlotte Bobcats. If all he wants to do is understand it from a peripheral broad perspective and just describe it back, well then he would have some very quantifiable research questions. And I've given you some examples there. But if you're interested, and that's in the blue there, uh, most of these research questions that are very quantifiable, they don't always go very deep, but they describe the differences between things or they connect to the, the relationship between things. And those questions usually just start with uh, what or how. And you can see I've given you five examples there. What are the characteristics of successful NCAA Division II ADs? How do poor marketers determine branding strategies? Uh, how does leadership style affect employees? at a YMCA. Now notice all of those are directed at a specific uh, level, Division II athletics uh, or, or specific business, uh, YMCAs. And so as you create your research questions, again, you want to be as specific as possible, uh, even when you're comparing broad-based things. So Matt may be comparing two things, two very distinct leadership styles. He's going to apply it to coaching, the laissez-faire and autocratic or democratic coaching styles or democratic, uh, autocratic style applied to the coaching setting. Now, Matt, you may even want to define that further and say collegiate coaching or amateur coaching or professional coaching. But the truth is those are going to cross over. But if you can narrow your research down, if Jack can narrow it down to one specific professional or, or an amateur sport organization, it's actually going to make it even more effective. Uh, so for somebody who's looking like Ivana to, to discuss and describe um, building up mental capacity, uh, it may not have an application to any one specific entity, whereas Jack is going to want to be far more detailed. If he can pick one organization, then we're going to be able to go so much further with that in our investigation, rather than just being very general. So again, go back to the initial three things I noted at, in parentheses at the top there, descriptive, comparative, or relationship-oriented. If you feel like your topic is describing something, you know, what is the relationship between power and student-athlete? You know, or maybe it's student-athletes at the D2 level. Maybe Corey wants to be a little more specific. And in that case, Corey, if you find a lot of stuff at D2, you can land on that. If you find that you find some good stuff, but it isn't just D2, you may have to take that out of your research questions and say, well, what's the, what's the relationship between power and student athlete, or power and the, between the coach and the athlete, something like that. The second type of research questions are far more deeper, and they, they're not really descriptive. So qualitative research questions are those that really are dive deep into a very specific topic because the researcher wants to understand the whys understand what is going on subsurface below the surface it's like peeling the onion four and five layers and i want to discern to be able to explain occurrences or suggest what's really going on in a major cause effect relationship and so for some of you if you really want to deep dive into a very narrow cavity or causeway then you would have some qualitative research questions and a lot of times the research questions that you choose might then therefore uh, depict the type of research you look at. Now there's a difference between quantitative and qualitative research. When you're looking at research studies, for those that have a lot of statistics, they run statistics that are called basic statistics and MANOVAs and ANOVAs and, and factor analysis and, and frequency analysis. When, when you see a lot of statistical tables and data, that is quantitative and that is descriptive and comparative. So that's that quantitative stuff I talked about earlier. But if you look at research that really dives down into one specific thing and has very little statistics, but they do a lot of uh, investigation into um, using interviews or using focus groups or using um, observation, for example, those are all qualitative research methods because they're really trying to understand 
some phenomena. They're really trying to understand a, a scenario or a situation to be able to explain it to society. They just don't understand it. So I don't want to just describe it. I don't want to just report on it. I want to really figure out why this is happening. And for some of you in here, that is a qualitative research study. So your questions need to be worded or written that way. Why do college athletes believe they should be paid? Not should they be paid, or not is there enough money to be paid? Remember, we talked about that in finance class. Most institutions can't afford to pay them. There's only a few D1s that can. So it's not about economics, but, but why do they believe? Now, that's a much deeper consideration that they should be paid. Why are more women becoming executives in the sport profession? Is sports specialization detrimental to the youth? Why are public baseball stadiums funded through bond referendums? So those are very, very descriptive in nature, but they dive deep down into a phenomena, into a condition or a circumstance and I write about that, so I use the word deep dive. It is a very deep dive down into a narrow cavity to understand what is actually going on subsurface in this specific area. And if that's you, then you're going to want to write your research question in such a meticulous way that it discerns using the why and sometimes some other areas associated with the word is. Now in the end, your personal responsibility by the time you come back on Monday, is to write a series of research questions. Now, you don't have to do it here in this particular class, but your assignment for Monday is to have research questions written out, and there's actually a link that I just made available, and it's below the link where this research paper document is that we're looking at. And uh, I want you to select the research questions and write them out. So you may want to this weekend write a few of them on paper, type a few of them up, and then when you have uh, two or three of them that you want to present to me, go in and complete that link by Monday. And I want those done by Monday morning because I want to look at that Monday. And I'm basically going to approve them for you. Uh, so the first question in the uh, assessment is, are you pursuing something that's quantitative or qualitative? And then I've asked you to give me three research questions. So this is not a graded assignment, but it is a step to move you to begin to fully research and gather stuff for your interview of bibliography and then prepare your presentation. So having said all that, are there any questions about what we're doing today and this weekend? Take this stuff, discern it, write three research questions, get them uploaded in Blackboard by Monday morning. Any questions about that? I want to review the schedule for next two weeks before we hit spring break. So if you do want to go to the schedule for a minute, again, it's the fourth link down. Got to keep that long if you want to. So next week, uh, I've given some remote time. So on Monday, I'm going to talk specifically about developing a really good presentation. What are, the, what are the characteristics, what are the antecedents that go into developing a good presentation? And what are some of the real duds, the things that you want to avoid in developing? and making sure that you avoid having a dud for a presentation. So my understanding though is it goes back to similar to the interview stuff. We, we Sometimes you gotta look at bad interviews to know what a good interview kind of sense is like and attract that. So I'm gonna focus Monday on developing really what I call high caliber presentations. Now that would then flow into the last three major projects you're working on uh, because the following week, which is the first week of March, you are presenting your professional communication project to us. Then when you get back after spring break and you've submitted your MCA bibliography, you all are going to have the chance through the month of March and into April to present this major research project. And then at the end of the semester, we do this fun little why people should fail, why people succeed. And that basically ends our semester. So I think going forward, there are, there are no more uh, minor individual professional development assignments. I think we're done with all of those. I'm still grading through the resume. But everything else is really updated. So I've always tried to make your grades available to you fairly quickly. Uh, the resume has to be done yet. But obviously, next week is an important week because I want you working specifically on your communication project. So I'm going to give you Wednesday and Friday as remote days to work individually, not here in the class setting, but individually on your communication project. And if you're not familiar with that, go back to that particular assignment. Because that combines some research and some interviews. 
on, a, on professional communication and creative marketing staff. And then we go away for spring break and we come back after spring break and we annotate these articles to do that. And anyways, make that do after break in case you want to work on that and polish that over with. But then that leads into your presentation, which then finishes off after Easter with your succeed and fail, and then we do a couple things and we're done. Any questions about any of that? All right, we know what we're doing. Have a great day. I'll see you all Monday. <laughs>